right, welcome back to The Popular Show. Hello to the regular listeners of the podcast and also hello to viewers of the Sublation Media YouTube channel. Always a pleasure to be with you. I'm James A. Smith uh, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ross Barkin, who is the biographer of Andrew Cuomo, the former governor of the state of New York. He's written uh, this book here, which is called The Prince. Uh, highly recommend uh, uh, that account of uh, Cuomo's governorship and fall from grace. Uh, Ross also writes regularly about New York politics, uh, especially for Jacobin magazine. And we're also joined by Mariah Fanebecker making her popular show debut. Uh, we've written a book together called Work, Want, Work, Labour and Desire at the End of Capitalism. Click the links below and get both of those books. We'd love you to read them. Really recommend uh, Ross's and also recommend mine. And Mariah's Mariah is also the German translator of the new edition of that book. Uh, while we've got you here, we'd love you to click through to our own popular show YouTube channel. Click the link below and consider joining our podcast community over at patreon.com forward slash the popular pod. Ross, Mariah, how are you both? Doing well. Great to be here. I'm glad Hi. you're doing well, Ross. Hi, Mariah. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm a bona fide COVID positive guest on your show. It can't be the first time. You're you're struggling with the Wuhan. Uh, thanks for coming on all the same. Really, really appreciate it. No worries. Um, so we've, we've covered a lot of aspects of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the state response on this show, often through a, a, a critical lens. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to sort of turn attention to um, the political dimension of, of the crisis. And on this episode, we're looking in particular at the management of care homes, uh, nursing homes uh, and the elderly in general uh, during the crisis. Uh, the lockdown measures and other COVID containment measures were often represented as having been brought in to protect the most run vulnerable and especially to protect the elderly. But there were ways in which a lot of those innovative measures that were brought in in that period actually had pretty devastating effects on the very people that they were advertised as protecting. Uh, but first of all, Mariela, perhaps you could take us into the, the issue of care in general, the care sector today and nursing homes. Why are these areas so important in your view to understanding capitalism today? Hmm. Yes, I mean, I should say I'm not an expert on care homes. I've come to the topic from the direction of um, taking an interest in work and the culture of polit and politics of work, really. And I'm also not one of the wise people who've thought about this for a very long time, but it is really only when the pandemic turned care homes into plague pits that um, I really started looking into them. But once I did, what I found really, you know, chilled me to the bone. And it's, I feel like it's been haunting me ever since because it's really such a gross and, and awful thing. And I mean, the, the story of, of social care in, in, in Europe and the, in the UK is, is quickly told, really, and sounds quite familiar by now. It's just, alas, another privatisation story. So, you know, obviously social care and, and care homes were, were part of the post-war settlements, were part of, part of the uh, the welfare states in Europe and, and in the UK after World War II. And then gradually became subject to privatisation in the UK since the 1980s and Europe since the 1990s, a little bit later. And, um, you know, and, and it's been, you know, the onward march of privatisation ever since. And I guess from the UK, we're quite used to these stories from the NHS, the way in which outsourcing and other forms of privatisation corrode a public um, service. But I feel like what's the story that isn't really told enough about social care, about care homes, is um, a, a story of the stock market, of private equity, of incredible profits that have been um, on the exponential rise, especially in Europe, actually, more even than in the UK in the, in the last decades. And um, yes, and, and it's, it's really a question of whether, you know, you want your dying grandmother to be a commodity on the stock market or not and whether this is really something that we might want to look into some more than we have done so far 
And um, I guess just to mention one example, in I think January, February time in Europe, there was a big scandal around the French um, multinational care home operator, Orpia, which um, it transpired via the work of the, the French investigative journalist, Victor Castanet, um, was really um, in the most brutal manner rationalising um, the care that they were offering to the extent that even in the wealthiest uh, flagship care home in, in a suburb of Paris, people were found you know, stewing in their unchanged nappies with food rationed. You know, these were rich, rich old people basically being starved to death <laughs> in a, a French suburb, which makes you think what's what's happening here and why is this, you know, never talked about quite beside, um, you know, the, the big story of the pandemic. Uh, so um, I- even prior to uh, the um, what, what amounts to a, a kind of sacrifice of, of care home residents during the pandemic, which we'll get into, there was a, a kind of perverse situation, really, where uh, our ageing populations in the rich world are represented as a kind of political and, and sociological crisis for for, governor, uh, for governments to deal with. At the same time, that growing ageing population is perceived um, by investors as a kind of cash cow uh, and uh, a, a, a way of, uh, of making enormous profits for, for very little service. But Ross, maybe you could take us into something of the backdrop of um, Andrew Cuomo's involvement in, in health policy and the health policy of New York. What, what was the kind of lay of the land? What was the state of things in New York State before the pandemic struck? So... In New York State, like in other states, there are many nursing homes and it's a very big industry and it's an industry that is very lucrative. Nursing homes are good and, you know, they can have a real service. But in America, certainly, they can be uh, very, very profitable. Um, And, you know, if if you run one, if you get patients in there, you know, it, it's, it's really a way through insurance to, you know, have this constant uh, stream of revenue. So the nursing home industry has always been, you know, politically powerful. And in New York, uh, the big issue was the management of COVID patients there. And this was an issue that went beyond New York. Um, what was unique was the way New York under Andrew Cuomo actually covered up for a long time, the number of people who died in nursing homes and also made uh, decisions to send COVID uh, positive patients back to nursing homes who had been in hospitals and, and still uh, were testing positive um, rather than keeping them in hospitals or, um, you know, putting them in makeshift facilities. And that, you know, most people believe led to excess deaths. Um, but one of the big issues in New York was the way the deaths were counted. I can go more into that, but the short of it, um, was that, um, you know, Andrew Cuomo, in order to sell the story, which was not true of, of success in the pandemic, you know, intentionally deflated uh, the number of deaths there, while other states, you know, uh, very pu- publicly were grappling um, with this catastrophe of nursing home deaths. And, and Cuomo propagated for a long time this false narrative that, no, in New York, they were fine um, because he was miscounting intentionally um, how, how they died. Um, so, you know, that was a big part of it. And, and certainly the, the other big part of it was the uh, legal immunity that the nursing home industry enjoyed for a very long time during the pandemic. And, um, even when this immunity shield was repealed, um, it was not retroactive. So if you had a, a family member who died in a nursing home from COVID, during a certain period in 2020, and I want to say into 2021, you really had no legal recourse. Um, this was a very strong immunity shield granted to nursing home providers, and, and that was done um, with the input of the you know healthcare nursing home industry, and then with the governor as well. And they worked very closely to put this policy into place. It was very controversial, and a lot of families were really quite upset about it. But as you can imagine, lacking a legal recourse, um, you know, uh, is very big deal when you've lost a loved one. It, it was amazing to see this scandal unfold around Andrew Cuomo, who, as you mentioned, had been a kind of great liberal hero and had uh, won, an, he'd won an Emmy for uh, his uh, TV appearances, um, 
you know, talking about uh, how the pandemic was developing, uh, wrote this uh, self-aggrandizing book about uh, kind of a you know a responsible response to a pandemic, and yet we were we were hearing like over in Britain um, descriptions of care home policies which totally mirrored those of Boris Johnson, who was regarded as this kind of Trumpian libertarian populist. So uh, ostensibly kind of opposites in terms of how these two leaders were presented. And yet, you know, here in Britain, we, we, we'd we uh, had all these kind of these scandals around NHS trusts producing guidance papers for what amounted to like a checklist for like keeping old people in care homes and stopping them going into hospitals, uh, policies uh, about sending old people out of hospitals and into care homes without testing them or even with positive tests an absolute kind of mirror of these appalling policies uh, that, that you were seeing uh, under Cuomo, uh, and yet from an ostensibly opposite, or, you know, if you just listen to mainstream media coverage, you'd think it was the opposite kind of leader who was who was doing that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, how did you kind of read that politically? Um, how, how, did, how did Cuomo get away with representing himself as kind of the opposite of... Trump or, or a figure like Boris Johnson for so long? I, I think, you know, it was very easy in some sense that moment to be a foil to Trump because, you know, Trump, of course, I, I'd say more so than Boris Johnson, you know, was really someone who um, was an, you know, an incendiary figure, but, but also just just ludicrous in the way he spoke and, and, and how he, um, you know, dealt with so many different issues. He was not someone who could be really taken seriously in a time of crisis. You know, when COVID hits, it's just like a lot of people, certainly um, on the left, and even in the center, could not realistically turn to Donald Trump for any sort of comfort or understanding or or trust that that he was going to effectively um, manage the pandemic. And so for, for Cuomo, it offered this very clear lane of, you know, I will go on TV and sound confident. And it really wasn't much more than that. It was, I'll be there every day. I'll speak in complete sentences. I will sound reassuring. Um, I will not, you know, speak crudely. Um, you know, I will not um, say, you know, head scratching or odd things or, or openly clash with journalists um, or be Donald Trump, right? I will be a conventional politician. And in that moment, it was enough. And, and he had, being in New York, you know, he's in the media capital of the United States. You know, there are by far um, more media outlets in New York than anywhere else in America. It, it's where, you know, cable TV is based as well. And so, you know, in, in, in this vacuum, he was able to step in very quickly. Um, and television in particular, you know, CNN, MSNBC, and other networks were very hungry, I think, for a narrative, you know, for, for a foil to Donald Trump. Um, and, and they got one, and Cuomo was very willing to uh, play that role. Um, and that's what it was, it was a role. And, and he really did it by sounding competent and, and reassuring people who are locked at home and scared. And there's no doubt there's a value to that to be a politician who can reassure the populace. And, deliver news calmly, but that's only part of the job. You also have to govern and, and, and actually make wise decisions that um, help people, and Cuomo did not do that. But he got the first part right. He got the aesthetics of governing right, um, but he did not get the actual policy part right. So j just to run through some some detail of um, of, of the effects of uh, of. of of COVID on, on care homes and COVID measures on care homes in the UK. Let, let me just give you some examples here. In the UK, COVID cases inside care homes increased immediately after lockdown measures were brought in in March 2020, even as they fell across the country. More than 90% of nursing home residents in the UK had do not resuscitate orders placed on them early in the pandemic, many of these without consultation with Patient, with the patients themselves, with relatives or with carers. People with dementia accounted for a quarter of all COVID-related deaths in England and Wales in the first wave of COVID. Across 25 countries, care home deaths were on average 30% of total COVID-19 deaths. 
Uh, and um, yeah, well, I, basically, you, you sort of see figures like that, and, and it's possible to think of COVID nineteen as having been a, a pandemic of the care home, uh, and yet we didn't tend to get that focus on on those people at the time, and very often they seem to kind of disappear from the, the narrative. Um, Riley, you said that it was really um, the these kind of um, discoveries of how care homes have been managed and treated and the absolute carnage, I think you said plague pits that they've been turned into during COVID that kind of brought you to the subject. What, what is it about the care homes specifically that you think kind of shines a light on um, how we're to understand what went on during the pandemic and how we look forward? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I guess the, tr the trouble with the care homes are that yes, they are increasingly commodified. They're increasingly um, very lucrative, like you said, Ross. Perhaps from an American perspective, this is slightly less shocking than from a European perspective, where there's still a remnant of of, of a sense of not just um, you know national social welfare, but also an idea of a social contract. So you know, often like as in Germany, this is all bound up with your kind of pension scheme, etc. The idea is you work so that you are taken care of when you can't take care of yourself and you're not expected to pay for it yourself. This is supposed to be part of the contract. Young people are supposed to pay for it. The state is supposed to sort of prop you up when you're old. And um, it seems that, you know, people still sort of more or less believe in that idea, but it's simply not true. Like die, the end of your life is completely commodified if you're not lucky enough to drop dead um, before you need um, extensive care and I guess uh, the extent to which um, profit are being extracted from from social care and especially in, in, in the care homes is just so extreme that um, it's just completely impossible to do so without exploiting both the residents at the care homes and the carers who are providing the work. So it's become this sort of um, interesting sort of um, weird vulnerable site I guess in our fragile social world but when you look too closely at it there's the sense that the whole thing is just going to implode so you know obviously people can't tend people tend on the whole not to be able to provide care for their elderly frail relatives because they have to work so you know because your own labor powers being so ruthlessly and efficiently used up there isn't that spare time there aren't women in the home who can look you know in the traditional post post-war um situation with the with the family wage who can look after the elderly so um so on the one hand everybody's working to survive and in the other um those old people aren't taken care of so the way in which the whole thing is just sort of um falling apart in the care home i think is quite interesting so i mean i guess one of the things that um you know james and i talked about in our book is how there are always these new these new areas of life which are hitherto untapped by capitalism which are now being found and I feel like the the, the new care home is is that um yes and I guess when we talk about excess mortality say in the pandemic that was of course already happening beforehand and it just got um exacerbated um in a in a huge way um yeah, I mean, going forward, um, I don't know. I guess the point is, is that we, could, we you cannot have um, a care home that makes money. It just doesn't work. You can't have social care. It's so complex. It's so expensive. It's so difficult. You just cannot have very good care for everyone. You know, of course, there's always exceptions for the 1% um, and make money out of it. It just doesn't work without killing everybody off I guess I feel like that's what the pandemic has showed that this isn't about providing care it's about an illusion of care which ultimately just commodifies death and dying and perhaps that is more apparent in a system that still pretends to you know offer this in theory to everyone. So we had Carl Hennigan uh, on the show before Christmas uh, and patrons have that uh, interview at patreon.com forward slash the popular pod uh, and Carl um, had, had been a, an advisor to the government in the UK and, and he got a, a sort of reputation in the press for being a kind of COVID denier which was actually totally unfair but one of the really interesting arguments that he made was about care homes and a kind of alternative model for how care homes could have been managed during the 
pandemic. And his, he was kind of pointing out, as, as you alluded to, Mariah, the way in which uh, the, these organisations are so dependent on extremely ill-paid, often migrant workers. So you've got a situation where you have very vulnerable old people being exploited. And at the same time, these kind of zero hours contracts, uh, uh, ex this exploited workforce working with them. So it's the, it, the exploited caring for the exploited. Uh, and part of um, the, the, that kind of for-profit model, the way in which that exacerbated uh, the, the excess mortality during the pandemic was that you had these um, these uh, uh, these privatized workers being carted from one care home to another, becoming vectors of disease in themselves. And, and Carl's argument was that if you had gone into this not um, thinking that you needed to kind of have this this total lockdown and anything where lockdown wouldn't work, you just kind of tried to keep it out of sight as he argues is what happened with the care homes instead if you've you, if you'd actually decommodified the sector a little bit and started paying people decently moved them into care homes and actually kind of paid them something uh, uh, that would make that work worthwhile then you could have greatly improved the situation and avoided that kind of way in which uh, the care homes were treated as something where it didn't really matter if disease was spread uh, between them by, by, by workers traveling back and forth. And I, I think that's just kind of one example of many of um, a, a way that if, if governments have been willing to radically reformulate how care is supposed to be approached, um, they, they could have been much better outcomes. But actually what they went for was a, a kind of model of lockdown that just tried to put everything about the economy on pause so that they could return to it unchanged after the pandemic was hopefully over. Uh, Ross, a, a lot of your coverage is uh, attentive to the progressive side of the Democratic Party and, and other kind of progressive movements in America, and I believe you've even run for office yourself. What, what in the kind of Cuomo adventure and the, the scandal, particularly of the care homes, have you sort of taken away as a sort of lesson for progressive politics or the kind of argument that the left should be making? That's a good question. In terms of reforming the nursing home industry, um, you've seen some politicians with one, Ron Kim in particular in New York City, progressive and a Bernie Sanders supporter who's been fighting very hard. He fought very hard against the immunity shield, you know, fighting to get compensation for the families who lost loved ones in, in the nursing home um, you know, mess. And that's like an ongoing fight to compensate these people. Um, you know, in terms of structural reforms, you know, I'd like to see more. I, I think the progressive space right now has not probably focused on it enough. I, I think one problem is healthcare in general has taken a backseat to current issues at play, you know, which in, in America, like in the UK, it, it's inflation um, and, and, you know, and economic concerns. And, and that, of course, matters a lot. Um, but the healthcare discussion, which really was prominent in the late 2010s has now receded a bit. And so I, I would like to see that come back. Um, and so in terms of the nursing home issue in particular, the new governor of New York who's not progressive, um, but it is not quite as, um, you know, venal and, and, and pathological as Cuomo was, um, you know, she is in the midst of, um, performing or commissioning a review of, of New York's response to COVID-19. So I think we're all very curious to see what that looks like, if it's a legitimately independent review that really looks at the mistakes that were made. Um, but, you know, um, I would like to see progressives take on the issue more. I, I think there is a, a question we're always going to need nursing homes and care homes. Um, can we also find ways to help people stay in their homes and apartments and, and have home health care. I, I, I'm, I'm more a believer in that than I used to be. And I don't know if that's a progressive position necessarily, but, but I think it, it might be uh, the, the, the safer, maybe even more dignified position. You know, if a person is capable of remaining in their home and if they can have health care paid for by the state or by the nation, um, perhaps they should be allowed to stay there because, you know, some nursing homes are great, some are not. Um, we saw with COVID, they really could be a traps for disease. Um, um, 
in many cases were shortening lifespans and perhaps senior citizens would have been better off if, if possible, you know, some are to have challenges that require around the clock care in a facility, but you know, for others, perhaps with, um, you know, home care that they could pay for, um, they could remain with home in their homes or, or with family. Right. So that's an ongoing discussion as well. Um, but you know, the healthcare industry is not changed in the United States. That's not changed in New York and, it, and it's quite inefficient here. It is quite expensive. Um, you know, there's a lot of middlemen and it, it's, you know, and it's very complex and difficult to unwind. And, you know, I would like to see progressives in general recommit to healthcare reform and, and, and fixing it. Um, Unfortunately, at the moment, it is. I do think it's lost some momentum, and we'll see. You know, the zeitgeist shifts and, and things change. Um, but currently, you know, between inflation, between the war in Ukraine, and these other issues, and the crowding out of the healthcare fight, which is unfortunate. But yeah, I, I mean, sorry, I, yeah, do come in, Ryla. Sorry, carry on. I mean, it's. It sounds depressing, and um, and I'm sure it is more difficult to, to change those entrenched structures in in the states. I mean, perhaps there is some remnant of hope in the fact that there still are, you know, nationally administered health care um, systems in in Europe and to to a degree in, in the UK. So, for example, with this you know privatization of care homes, which has been ongoing. Um, I mean, it has, you know, as you rightly say, um, care homes have gotten a very bad rep recently. And um, some states have managed to, um, to, you know, to put a pin in it and to stop it and even to, to go back. So, you know, Norway has um, republicized its social care sector after it decided that privatization wasn't working and wasn't efficient and wasn't, you know, wasn't providing a cost efficient service. And um, I think another example was uh, like some where it's devolved, like in some countries it's a devolved issue. So in, in Austria, some Austrian states have, have gone back. So there's some some hope in that, I think. And But also specifically on the idea of care in the home. Well, it's part of the British story that, um, you know, um, Social care is provided by the council to an extent, and then people have to pay, and it's a means-tested thing. But um, uh, traditionally, there were there was a lot of social care given in people's homes that was paid for by the council, and it's only privatisation which has made this uh, strip the service um, and made it so much less good than it used to be. So, like I think we do tend to often go very quickly back to oh it's very complex well it's only complex because of the degree of privatization that we've allowed and it's ultimately very simple which is more money more public money needs to be spent on it and where lots of public money is being spent on it it ends up being cheaper and it works better um and it's i guess it's not such a such a, such a complicated demand to make after all yeah, I, I think that's really important. Um, uh, regular listeners and viewers of the show w won't be surprised to hear me say that I, I think that COVID has thrown the left's priorities off course in so many ways. And, and it, it's uh, good to hear you, Ross, um, saying that you think there needs to be a kind of reset on the on the left's commitments over healthcare. I mean, just for one example, it was so much uh, a leitmotif of the Jeremy Corbyn project that uh, Corbynism involved bringing social care and healthcare together under one roof uh, and as one system. I, I just haven't heard that kind of talk uh, on the left since COVID. And part of it is that a lot of people became very uncritical when suddenly it became our job to, like, defend vaccination at all costs, to, to defend um, public health measures at all costs, rather uncritically, frankly. So I, I totally agree that there needs to be a kind of um, a, a, a return to a, a kind of left critical view on health. And uh, and making it an absolute kind of core priority that, um, that, that yeah, health and social care are the are the the, the very heart of any kind of progressive uh, agenda. I'd also be very interested how far it's a kind of 
common development. So you said you're not sure if it's a progressive view or not that healthcare should be, uh, sorry, that uh, elder care should, as far as possible, be committed to keeping people in their own homes rather than bringing them uh, into uh, institutions in this way. And yeah, I, that it's important that Morella reminds us that really it's a, it, it's a symptom of this kind of privatization and um, more broadly the way that, yeah, we don't actually, we're not permitted time to look after our, our families in the way that we uh, maybe were in previous uh, stages of, of capitalism. Um, what, what about this is a human rights issue. That, that's the way that some kind of critical voices that have been trying to get um, attention on the care home scandal during COVID have, have framed this. The Care Quality Commission in the UK has focused on the do not resuscitate uh, orders. I, I don't know how kind of well, uh, um, widespread this was internationally, but um, th these were these were measures where if uh, if somebody was hospitalised or if somebody was in a care home and they stopped breathing, then uh, there was a contractual uh, uh, commitment to not resuscitating them. Something that can only be interpreted as like a desire to kind of get rid of excess inconvenient. Uh, people and Martin Vernon, the former NHS director uh, of old people, described the kind of frailty scoring that I was referring to earlier in Britain, where there was a sort of you know checklist to try to avoid hospitalising people and just l leaving them to die at home or in the care home. Uh, that that uh, Martin Vernon referred to that as a flagrant breach of equality law. Uh, I, I know that you, you've got an interest in human rights and, and, and critical views of human rights, Mariana, that you're writing about at the moment. I wonder if you've kind of got any insight into how, you know, when we are getting criticisms of what happened, it's tending to be framed as a rights issue. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible um, list of things you've just mentioned there and it does make it sound like a rather British story it makes you think of that sort of Vic Victorian fear of the poor house that would keep you know workers um, and in whatever horrible work they were just so they wouldn't end up in the poor house because it was such a dreadful place and people just died like flies in there and it seems like um, the care homes are becoming like a you know 21st century version of that um, I guess in terms of the human rights um, issue, I don't want to get into it too much, but um, it did rather make, I did find it rather um, worrying when human rights were the one thing that always came up in terms of the telling of the British story of the care homes and, <laughs> care homes and the pandemic. In fact, Amnesty International also did, did some reports on Spain, I think, and Belgium and Italy regarding the um disregard of, of people's human rights um well of course i mean i don't disagree certainly when you're being bullied by your primary health provider as people um, were in the uk to give up your right to live in writing to give up the idea that you wanted to be resuscitated because you know um, your GP was gently hinting that you know chances for you weren't so good so don't use up the resources then it's perhaps a human rights issue, but um, I think uh, Hannah Arendt is good on this and on totalitarianism, where she says that when when it's a human rights that are being invoked, you really are in trouble because what this normally means is that you haven't got any better actually legal rights to fall back on, i.e. the rights of a citizen. And she's talking there about stateless people between the wars uh, in the run up to the Second World War. But it seems that her argument applies here, too. You know, you really shouldn't have to. Um, talking about your human rights it should be your right as a citizen and as um you know as somebody who's part of of the this social system and indeed of that social contract that you don't have to um forego your right to live just because you're old and frail um so yeah so this seems like kind of worrying um symptom of of the moment that we're in where the the systems that there are um are under so much pressure precisely from um, privatisation, that there's really nothing left there in terms of even something as basic as your right to, to stay alive um, when you're old. Human rights are for people who don't have political movements uh, or, or, or political recourse or, or defence, I guess. I, I think that does fit very well. Um, Ross, uh, kind of on a related note, you mentioned before that um, uh, 
the the successor to to Cuomo and to Cuomoism uh, is currently be be decided. Ka uh, Kathy Hockul, right? Is, 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 the, is the is the I'm not going to use the right language here, but the interim leader and is running to replace Cuomo wholesale, right? So she she is she is the full fledged governor. So it, it, it's okay. not interim. She's run so she's running for a full term this year. Uh, but the way it works in New York and, and I think every state in, in America is you have actually not every state. Some states don't have lieutenant governor. So in New York, you have a governor and you have a lieutenant governor. And the lieutenant governor is very much a ceremonial role. They have very few formal powers. The only power they have is the governor resigns for any reason or dies or incapacitated. Lieutenant governor is sworn in as the governor and is the governor until, um, you know, if, as long as they can win re-election. So Hochul became governor upon Cuomo's resignation last year, and, and she was sworn in as the governor of New York. And now this year, she has to run for a full four-year term. Um, so she's governor guaranteed through the end of this year. And if she wins in November, then she gets four more years. So she, she is the current governor, and she's expected to win. So... Um, you know, she will then have, you know, a while to lead the state. So I, I guess the reason I ask is Andrew Cuomo wasn't brought down because of the kind of issues we're discussing here. He was brought down kind of on on the Democrat Democratic Party's own preferred terms, on liberal America's preferred terms, if, if you like. He, he was a guy who was the very model of the liberal leader, the anti-Trump. He was even for a time the anti-Biden. There was talk, as I recall, of uh, you know some machination being deployed to make him the Democratic candidate instead of Joe Biden. So he, he was liberal America in that respect. And uh, there was no reckoning with his austerity measures, his hospital closures before the uh, pandemic, as, as you describe uh, so well in your book, there was no reckoning with um, the, 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 the kind of um, uh, uh, absolutely c criminal um, uh, uh, dimensions of his, of his pandemic response. He was taken down with Me Too. He was taken down on the basis of his sexual misdemeanors. Uh, is there a way in which that lack of a reckoning with his wider political project informs um the 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 kind of passing of the the baton onto hokel uh is is there is there a way in which we can see kind of the future of new york politics and, and democratic party politics in general as maybe stimmied or retarded by the fact that there hasn't been that reckoning with with what was actually you know, well Massive. Yes, uh, it definitely can be argued Cuomo should have been impeached and, and be forced to resign over his handling of COVID, over um, the cover-up of nursing home deaths, um, you know, over the fact that he took a multi-million dollar book advance um, in the first year of the pandemic and actually used his own staff to write this pandemic memoir. Um, hey, by the way, Boris Johnson at least had the decency to shelve the Shakespeare biography he was supposed to be writing. At least he didn't write a book. Yes, <laughs> Olmo did. Olmo wrote a pandemic memoir during the pandemic. He got a lot of money for it. So, you know, there was a, there was a lot that he could have been really, um, you know, faced the consequences for. And then, fortunately, he didn't. And, you know, it was good that, you know, the women who brought the um, accusations against him, you know, got a form of justice and that, you know, he resigned. He would have been impeached if he didn't resign. But it was, it was some, somewhat unfortunate that in this maelstrom, you then lost sight of the other failures. And my hope is there will be more reckoning with that. I, I do think with Cuomo um, diminished now, people can look with more clear eyes at New York's response to the pandemic, you know, early on, that was impossible, especially with Trump in office. Because anytime you bring up Cuomo's conduct, they would say, what about Trump? What about Trump? So that thankfully has faded. So my hope is that in the coming months and years, there will be a more sober reckoning with it. Uh, hasn't quite come yet. I am curious to see 
what this um, state report on the COVID response looks like, and if it's going to be legitimately independent. Um, you know, certainly there there was a you know the, the first blow to Cuomo was actually a report from the state attorney general early twenty twenty one that said he miscounted definitively you know, miscounted the number of deaths in nursing homes and used faulty criteria. And that did carry pretty widely. It wasn't enough to end his tenure, but it was the first blow struck against him. So I do think um, average New Yorkers are no longer celebratory of of Cuomo or of his legacy. Um, I would like to see a wider reckoning and, and, you know, I hope that in the coming months and years that will come. Marilo, uh, your most recent publication is in is in the German language, Jacobin, uh, and it is is also about care homes, but is about the representation of care homes in in fiction in Michelle Welbeck's new novel. I, I mean, it, it, it's c- kind of a truism that the very old are, are excluded from culture and cultural representation very often. So it, it's interesting that you know one of the most reviled but also celebrated novelists of today is turning to the subject what was the significance there oh well i mean the the interesting thing there was is that he well back took an took an interest in the care homes and in, in the um disaster the treatment of the old during the pandemic very early on and then um wrote this book which came came out fairly recently, right at the end of the pandemic, um, which takes the sort of um, care home as the care home is one of the, the main sites of the action that, you know, a care home resident is one of the, the main characters, but um, then it kind of sort of turns away from the issue of the care home very quickly to just make it about this almost sort of Tarantino-esque um sort of childish um, revenge fantasy where the uh, care home resident who would have died in the care home because the care is so bad just gets kidnapped by the family and um, you know kind of uh, that probably doesn't even make sense in the American context because you know why you can always leave for, for a service that you're just paying for so this idea that there's this evil technocratic state which somehow treats you badly and you know it just turns it into like a, a reactionary fantasy of, of self-control and of completely getting out of this communal space of the care home and just being cared for by your loved ones at home sort of thing so it's a, it's a, it's a silly thing it's a, it's a failure as far as it's a, a treatment of the care home but I guess something that I was interested in there was um, like a, a bigger cultural point which is that um, you know the question why given this awful thing happened um, in the care homes given like you said it really was a pandemic of the care home how come that that could have disappeared so quickly? Perhaps also, you know, in, in the context of Cuomo, how come he did not get impeached for the, for the care home disaster? Well, perhaps the bigger cultural point is that it is actually almost impossible to talk about old age and death or to, 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 to allow yourself to think about old age and death under the kind of extreme form of capitalism that we've ended up under. And... Um, a point that interests me here, there's one that um, Secret Krak- Krakow makes already in the 1920s, but in the context of a kind of um, ramping up of capitalism, where he says the reason why here in the 20s in Berlin we've got such an insane youth cult is because all of these young workers whose labor power is being exploited in this relentless way. Um, they can't really imagine a future beyond their work life and they can't mm. imagine a point to their work life, a point, a project, a, a kind of, you know, a, some sort of um, uh, reason for living um, or, or some sort of legacy beyond their own death. So because capitalism and, you know, rationalised industrial, um, you know, mass capitalism that he's describing then the, um, doesn't really allow you that, it doesn't allow you to think of death. And, you know, that's 1920s Berlin and he's talking about people working, you know, like low level white collar workers um, in, in Berlin companies at the time. And it seems to me that there's still a lot of truth in that and that part of the reason that it's so easy to repress the topic is the impossibility of it really, you know. <laughs> We can't bear to think that we ourselves or indeed um, our older loved ones, if we haven't managed to keep up a pile of gold to protect us from it, we'll end up in these 
you know, Kafkaesque horror institutions if you're in Europe, or I gather if you're in America, just on the street. Um, you know, either way, it's un unthinkable that that is, you know, you will be thrown on the trash heap once you're old in, a, in this sort of extreme form of capitalism. And obviously that's not much of a prospect. I think that that Krakauer um, uh, point from the 20s actually really does describe the situation today because what we're, the people we're talking about in these care homes are the the baby boomers, are, are the, 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 la the, the kind of last group to um, have meaningfully experienced the world before neoliberalism who are now among its most abject objects of exploitation and expulsion and rejection and meanwhile the, the 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 people who are making policy decisions about them and also the the younger left who under other circumstances might be fighting meaningfully for their interests uh like those young people in the 20s that you're describing their lives and careers are so um are so confusing and interrupted and and, and seemingly futureless that it's very hard for perhaps psychologically hard to identify with the old uh, now more than ever. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think that this has um, been very valuable uh, from both of you, the account that you've given of um, really the, the centrality in many ways of the, the care homes to the tragedy of the pandemic. And I think it is just worth emphasising that these were the people who all of those measures were constantly justified as being in their interests. And yet they were among uh, the most kind of abject victims of uh, the COVID period. Um, whether the left can take hold of that fact and whether liberals can um, start to hold their own side to account for those failings as opposed to, um, you know, turning to more personal things and, and Me Too and so on remains to be seen. But um, Ross Barkin and Mariah Lefanabecker, thank you very much for joining us on The Popular Show uh, and we also thank the viewers at Sublation Media and our own podcast listeners. If you'd like to support the show, join us at patreon.com forward slash the popular pod. But again, thank you very much to our guests. Thank you.